Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Security Field Day. I'm Suraj Chandrasekharan, Director of Sales and Solution Engineering at Versa Networks. In this session, I will explain how Versa enables zero trust network access, especially for the post-pandemic world. I shall go over how Versa provides a secure control environment that can be used by users coming from anywhere since work is not a place anymore. So let's start with the overview of the Versa SASE solution. So Versa SASE fabric is the heart and soul of the SASE fabric. It is made of the Versa cloud gateways uh, that are stood up across the world in different data centers running the Versa sd wan overlay with a patented multi-cloud traffic engineering protocol. This way, traffic coming from anywhere whether it is a branch office or from your remote users, can be consolidated as a single source of truth. Branch offices location the, the same Versa operating system that runs on the Versa cloud gateways also run in the branch office networks as well. So these was instances can be used to connect your branch office users to the SASE gateways, which then can take the traffic back to your data center or other applications. When it comes to remote users, Versa in fact supports different methods. For example, it could be a small footprint uh, was instance sitting at your device uh, user's device, uh, location, or it could be a Versa secure access agent, like a software agent that goes on to the user's devices like mobile or uh, laptops. We also support agentless mechanisms such as app reverse proxy, pack file, and application proxy as well. We do support for users coming in from legacy branch of his uh, networks. If it is actually using a legacy router, we do support other mechanisms such as IPSEC or GRE tunnel to bring the traffic over to the SASE fabric, which then can take the traffic to appropriate destinations. So when traffic coming in from different users can be consolidated through the SASE fabric, they would have to go through uh, kind of a scrubbing, a security scrubbing, and then be able to connect back to the data centers. And these data center applications could be in a physical location or could be in a virtual cloud, such as AWS, Azure, VPC, such etc. And here, Versa in fact supports both a Versa operating system, a virtual instance of it running in the virtual cloud, or can use IPSec or GRE tunnel methods to connect to these uh, AWS transit gateways or Azure VBANs and every, uh, other such public cloud uh, native IPSec gateways. We also do support traffic going into your internet or other SaaS applications because we are one hop away from all those uh, SaaS applications as well. All of these need to be managed. So your network, your security policies need to be able to consolidate, be consolidated using a single pane management. And that is where the Versa Concerto or Titan based portal comes in. So using this, you are able to deploy, manage, orchestrate, see real in, in uh, real time what is happening along with the uh, big data based uh, analytics engine all in a single pane of management using the Versa Concerto platform. So I would like to actually talk about the SASE client specifically because this is a industry's first SD-WAN experience brought on to an agent without requiring an SD-WAN device. So we are able to, in fact, create multiple tunnels, a purple tunnel or a blue tunnel to different gateways. Imagine a scenario where you have two different applications, one in the US West and the other in EMEA. Both of them, the user needs to simultaneously access. To be able to get the best experience for, this for both these applications, Versa supports being able to make sure you can have your application X traffic going through the blue channel and an application Y traffic going through the purple channel. That way you're still able to provide the same application experience for both of these. We are able to also support these two tunnels, be able to be created over two different access circuits, one over a wire access and another over wireless access. So let's say you are in a, a Zoom call or a conference you want to actually move from your cube to a conference uh, room. And from a wired connection, you can seamlessly move your traffic to a wireless connection and make sure there is no uh, actual drop. And the user doesn't have to do anything. It, all of that is taken care of by the SASE client. 
talking about which, uh, talking about the SASE uh, or SG band like experience, right? You want to be able to provide application uh, visibility as well as application traffic sharing. So, in fact, with Versa SASE client, you are able to share traffic based on application based policies, not just network prefix based. You're able to specify application X has to go through the SASE gateway to reach its destination. Application Y can go directly uh, over DAA or split tunnel policies. Or traffic can be going over a secure tunnel uh, or uh, a null encrypt tunnel. So all of that capabilities are possible using the Versa SASE client, which is the industry's first or the only uh, sd band like experience brought to the SASE agent. Let's actually see some of these in action. So for our demonstration today, I have brought up this demo topology, which actually has six different gateways across the world. Three of them in the US, three others in across the world. So there are two in San Jose, one and two, and one in Ashburn, Norway, Paris, and Mumbai. I also have brought up clients in different parts of the world as well, uh, Mumbai and Norway and San Jose and, like, and Ashburn. So for identity, we're actually using Azure AD as our identity provider, being able to then have the user come in, authenticate themselves in the Active Directory that Azure provides. Uh, I also have brought up two different applications, uh, corporate.globex.com and consultant.globex.com in a Fremont data center, which is connected through an SD-WAN fabric that is extended from our SASE fabric. And all of that, of course, be monitored in real time from our Versa uh, SASE portal. So to be able to demonstrate each of these capabilities, let me give a precursor to some of the uh, individual uh, feature set that we have. So in fact, to be able to provide complete protection, we categorize the each of the protection under three different stages. First, to be able to provide complete identity and context, you need to be able to authenticate the user. Here, Versa supports different types of enterprise authentication mechanisms, such as LDAP AD, Azure AD, ADFS, Radius, Kerberos, you name it. And in fact, SAML with the third party or with Azure SAML as well. So you are able to then identify the user. Once the credentials are validated, you want to be able to make sure the person is in fact he, who he says he is. You do so by providing additional authorization using a two-factor or multi-factor authentication system. So we some, in fact support an OTP that it could be sent over SMS or email as well as a, a, a multi-factor authentication, like a notification that gets sent to your user's mobile device app, like a Microsoft, Google, or Duo authenticators. We also support pre-login methods of uh, identity, or logging in for Windows domain joint networks. So once you actually have the user authenticated, you want to be able to provide a specific profile sent to the user's device based on the user's uh, user identity, as well as the user group that he belongs to. We also can do so by making sure, uh, based on the location that you come in from, he comes in from, you identify uh, the appropriate policies that needs to be pushed to him. Talking about which, the device that receives that need to be having a certain posture. So you are able to identify a device posture based on the, user, the actual device type, the device operating system, whether the security patch has been updated, uh, whether it actually runs uh, endpoint protection software, if it runs an endpoint protection software, what is, if it has been updated the, uh, with the latest security updates, all of that along with whether the device is managed or unmanaged, if the device is managed, whether it is in a compliant state right now, all of that consolidated together gives you the complete posture and the context of the user to then be able to use that in your uh, uh, profile push. So let's see some of that in action right now. So I have here uh, pre-installed our Versa SASE client in this particular VM in San Jose. I also have actually brought up uh, this particular SASE client and registered with two different profiles. And here you can see that the SASE client, in fact, is also multi-tenant. This is again, industry's only SASE client which has multi-tenancy at the client. So you are able to register or use this for multiple organizations if you need to. Uh, so here I use this multi-tenant capability of that to register with two different accounts, one belonging to a consultant business group. And you can see that once it got registered and always on uh, option was disabled for this particular user. And the profiles that got pushed for this user belonging to a consultant business group are just the three gateways in the US, Ashburn, San Jose ones. 
Excuse me a second. Are you telling yeah. me the Versa client is the MDM or are you separate using a separate MDM? Uh, we can use a separate MDM, but in this particular case, uh, we are able to provide the host information that we can collect from the host and then provide that to our SASE gateway to get some of the capabilities. For certain others, we basically can, uh, if, the, if the enterprise already uses an MDM, then they can use uh, the, you can query the MDM to get additional compliance status. So how do you authenticate the device? Ignore the user, how do you authenticate the device? How do you so, know that's a valid device? Yeah, great question. So if the user is coming from a SASE client, right? No, 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 way, no, so, you, 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 you just went to user land, I said the device. How do you know this is a valid device? Ignore the user, tell me mm -hmm. how you know this is a valid device. And you're just gonna say MDM, I get that. But somewhere you need to say this is a valid device and allowed to connect. Yeah, so the uh, for getting the portion of the device, whether it is a compliant or a valid device, we basically query the MDM in uh, in real time when the user comes in, and that query basically tells us whether it's a managed or unmanaged device. If it is a managed device, it basically accepts. If it is unmanaged, it will basically be able to say, hey, this is not a, an, a managed device, and so will not be allowed according to the MDM provided policy. So the MDM basically tells us whether to accept this device or not. Uh, I'll also let our CTO uh, provide additional clarity here. Hi, uh, I'm Apuru Mehta. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Versa Networks. So even when we are not interfacing with the MDM, we can basically do a device authentication based on device cert, uh, as well as conditional access cards and a lot of other things. So that is another mechanism of basically identifying whether basically that uh, the device is the device uh, which is intended to be intended to be on the network. So how is the device cert put onto the device when you don't have access to the device? From yeah. The user. Yeah. How is that done safely and securely? How yeah, no, so one that? is that one is definitely the enterprise could have basically done it through AD or SCCM or any of those mechanism. But the other thing is that the Warsa uh, registrar portal itself can basically install a cert if necessary. If I'm a remote user and never going into an office anywhere, which happens today, how do yeah. you get that cert onto the device when it's not? So the device gets drop shipped to the user, like a MacBook or something. How do I get that device cert onto the my laptop, for example, or my iPad? No, very clear fashion because I'm not going to send it out to somewhere. I need to be able to use it that next hour. A very good question. So what happens that Versa also supports pre-login. So when you, when you uh, the, like, let's say that uh, the, the Cor Cor Acme Corporation ships, uh, ships um, a laptop to a new employee who has never been to the company, then what will happen that uh, uh, when the user logs in, you know, the, uh, based on the pre-login, the user will be basically uh, given, uh, he will connect to the SASE gateway, but it will be a restricted, uh, uh, it will be a restricted uh, routing instance. And based on that, he will only connect to the AD or the SCCM. And that thing can, be, once he authenticates, you know, that the AD or the SCCM can download the device cert as well. And after that, basically, uh, the device is now has a valid cert and the device is uh, authenticated. That's how it happens. So you guys use a device cert to somehow, you get onto the device. Yeah. That authenticates the device to your network. And then you do a user authentication. That is correct. But the thing is, I hope I, I was able to answer your question that based on pre-login, uh, what happens? That Absolutely. Device... Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great, Great question, by the way. So here, uh, to rehash here, uh, what I was about to say, uh, here, we, this particular user belonging to a consultant business group got pushed with only limited profiles, only belonging to the gateways in the US. And also, when the profiles got pushed, they were appropriately providing only the prefixes for the private network and not for all uh, default route or, or basically to the entire network. Uh, so here he has only specific prefixes that he has access to that will be pushed to this particular user. So he doesn't have complete protection because he's just a consultant. But then the other user group uh, that got registered, uh, the user here belonging to a corporate business group here always on is enabled for this particular user. And then also when the, uh, the gateways that got pushed and he has access to are across the world, and you can see that it is all forced, which basically means 
all traffic, irrespective of where the destination is, is carried over the tunnel securely to the SASE gateway, which can then scrub before it goes to the appropriate destination. So this gives complete protection for this corporate uh, user. So I'll also go through another client here in Mumbai. So this particular user belonging to a considered business group has now uh, traveled to Mumbai, India, and trying to access the corporate network and try to register this device uh, uh, to access a corporate network. Let's see what happens here. So here you will see that uh, once it, during this uh, registration process, it basically goes through the authentication. So where uh, our IDP uh, Azure with SAML uh, gets, look there you can see that there is a redirection in a uh, browser redirection for Azure SAML. And during this process is where the user credentials are validated. And as soon as the credentials are validated, the device basically, the application basically tells the location of the device and, or, or it could be identified based on the IP address as well. And you can see that the error message says that, sorry, you're not allowed to register from outside the US. This basically shows how based on the location, the user basically can be limited uh, from accessing or registering his device. So let's go at another use case where I'll show uh, how the users based on device identity or, or device posture will be allowed or disallowed. So this particular user is allowed to register. This is, uh, assume this is a managed device. So let's go through uh, the registration process for this particular user, let's see. So during this registration process, you can see that it is validated that this is a corporate device and then the appropriate registration profile got pushed for this particular user. Whereas, let me go through the same with a different uh, device. So when he goes through the registration using a different device, uh, yes, SFO, SFO zero one POC, okay. So imagine this to be his personal device. And here you can see that the device is not managed. So use corporate provided device to connect. So it basically gives the appropriate error message to state why this particular user was not allowed to register this using this particular device. So this way you will be able to identify the device and appropriately based on the user who uses this device will be allowed or disallowed from using this uh, device to register with our network. Uh, a couple, couple quick questions. I think they're both related here. Uh, I, I see the client here that you're using the Versa client, is that brandable? Can you? change that to like a organization yes. branding. Um, and same with the VPN endpoints. I see you pointing at some Versa, uh, dot versa, versa dot, dot, dot com domains. So is mm -hmm. that uh, CNAMable or something along those lines too? Is again, changing the branding to make it a organization's yes. view? Yes, to both. In fact, all these logos can be brandable. So we will be able to actually push an appropriate logo based on a specific uh, registration. So here, especially because we have multi-tenancy, I'll also we'll also be able to say based on the appropriate um, uh, enterprise organization that is picked, you'll be able to change the logo also. So you can have multiple logos for the same client because it is multi-tenant. And to address your second question about the uh, uh, registration process, so in right now it basically goes to our SASE gateways, the FQDN. But then these, F you'll actually be able to create your own enterprise FQDNs that can see named to one of our gateways appropriately. And in a best gateway selection process, it can automatically pick or, or select the uh, closest gate, SAS gateway that we have. Okay, thank you. Question. Uh, the, the client is a universal, right? So we can uh, terminate the VPN tunnels here and also the MDM and the SAS. It's all within the single single application. Is it right? Or that is you right. Can separate? Okay. Yeah, so authentication and the connection is all from the same client, that is correct. Okay. Yeah. So now, um, let me go back to my presentation. So I'm gonna, now that the user has registered, 
you want to be able to have the user connect to the gateway. And here is where there are additional security functions that we actually have. So the first one is about fail close or fail open. As you all know, whenever a user gets a corporate laptop and uh, we know who we are, uh, we actually use the same device for other personal uh, web browsing purposes as well. So uh, including uh, yours faithfully. So when I do that, I might unintentionally uh, access something on the internet and then download some malicious content. And then I'll then be able to connect back to a private network and potentially spread the infection across. So you want to allow, avoid the situation by providing a kind of a, a limitation to make sure this particular laptop or a device, the corporate provided device, cannot be allowed to connect to or used to connect to any other FQDNs that is not allowed. So maybe you will be able to say what domains are allowed and what is not. And, and so that based on the appropriate domains that are allowed, the user can, without, the, without connection to the gateway and authenticating himself, he might be able to just connect to those limited set of uh, domains. So here uh, you can see, we actually have this fail open or fail close mode that you can pass on during the registration process, a profile uh, that could be automated for the specific user of a specific device. And then you can say what, what domains are allowed and what domains are not allowed based on uh, when, when it is in the fail close mode. I have a question about the fail open piece. Yep. Sorry, this is Remington. So if you fail open, are you still collecting information about where the user goes at that point? Or are you simply allowing it to go through or are you not collecting information at all? So by default, we do not collect the information, but well, because this particular, the, the client is basically not really connecting to anything, right? So the client is basically in a, in a uh, dormant state. So because of that, we do not collect the information today. Uh, so the process basically uh, kicks in only when it is connecting to the SASE gateway and when the traffic is going through that. Thank you. So uh, the next thing is about best creative selection. And here again, I wanted to point out a huge differentiator with Versa. So in addition to all the other vendors who might be able to do uh, the best gateway or select gateway selection process based on a physical or a network proximity, like for example, a latency check, what Versa does, in fact, is using the SASE fabric, each of the SASE gateways talk to each other and replicate or, or provide the information about the tenants that they are uh, servicing, the real-time CPU, memory, and the load characteristics for each of these gateways with each of the, each of the gateway. So that whenever the client basically tries to connect to one of those, the gateway, if it is loaded, will be able to check within the SASE fabric, which is the actual better gateway for that particular uh, user, uh, for the particular location and instruct the SASE client, hey, I'm loaded right now. Why don't you connect to these set of gateways instead? And then the client automatically picks the alternate gateway. And the user in this particular case does not have to do anything. They just, while, uh, while they actually provide the authentication credentials, everything happens in the background and the automate, automatically the SASE client picks the best gateway. And here is where being able to provide a limited set of gateway access to specific users. So for executives, they might have access to all the gateways across the world. And for uh, enterprise or uh, corporate users, you might actually be restricting to certain gateways. So that based on the gateway available for selection, it's still the SASE client picks the best gateway for that particular user for that particular location. Uh, the next one is about uh, gateway client policy, right? So in addition to during the registration process where we get the complete context of the user, you still want to validate or continue to validate the user, the location, as well as the device continuously so that the device posture, if it had, been, if it had changed since the time he got registered, you want to still validate while he tries to connect to the gateway. And also if the user has moved, you want to make sure the new location that he's trying to connect from is still valid or trusted from uh, so that he can be approved to connect from that particular location. So we also use other AA and ML methods to make sure the impossible move vectors, such as simultaneously if he's trying to log in from two different locations, which is impossible to actually physically impossible to log in from. We also have we, we have capabilities to trigger our uh, AAML based algorithms to then disapprove of such connect connections. So I'm going to show some of that in action right now. So I so, have excuse me before you go into yeah. that. When you guys put the, the device cert in the user cert on the client, are you using the built-in TPMs? Um, I'll let our CTO answer that. Uh, are you using yeah. the trusted platform yeah. modules or storing them locally on disk with an encryption key somewhere else? Uh, 
Yeah, so the thing is, basically, whenever the TPM, I mean, most laptops do have a TPM, and at that point, we would use a TPM. And we do use the uh, OS's uh, basically trust tools uh, to store them. You know, uh, as you know, that this is a multi tenant device. So if the same uh, uh, pay, um, if the same user belongs to multiple tenants, then you do need to basically store in the appropriate trust source. We do all of that. And then the key for the trust source you put into the TPM. That is correct. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Aparu. So uh, let me show the other client. So this particular client has previously registered. So as a consultant user, and he got a certain access to the gateways in the US. But then he has now traveled to Norway and trying to actually connect to his private network through the same. Let's see what happens. And yet again, this is going to go through the actual uh, client validation or uh, the, the um, authentication process. So you see the in-app browser redirection. So this particular now, so you also see this profile sync. So during this process of connecting, we also have another capability to make sure if a particular profile got changed for this particular user, the client automatically tries to authenticate or, or get that new information, download it, and be able to pick the changed profile. And if the profile got changed for any, whatever reason, then it goes through an authentication process uh, again to make sure this particular user uh, was still valid for uh, to access a particular network. So here you can see that uh, now it says, sorry, you're not allowed to connect from outside the US. So that uh, because he has traveled, even though the, the device was registered, he is not allowed to connect uh, to the uh, data center. So always on is again, uh, table stakes, I think a feature, but I still wanted to talk about that quickly uh, because we do have certain uh, differences in the way that we do that. So in addition to being able to provide an always on capability to make sure as long as internet is available, you have your client devices connect to the SASE gateway to get complete protection. We do have a capability to either completely dissolve from the user from connecting or disconnecting while always on is enabled, or we also provide a capability to uh, for the uh, from for the particular user's device to specify how long they can be disconnected if ever they get disconnected for whatever reason. So for executive users, for example, you might allow them to disconnect momentarily for between a uh, time duration of one minute to, all, uh, to 30 minutes so that they can do whatever they intend to do during that particular time and then they can connect back. So for certain set of users, you can always push that profile to make provide some cable, uh, some, uh, uh, even though always one is enabled, you can provide them a capability to disconnect. Uh, trusted network detection is again, a very important feature, right? So especially with, users coming in from both branch office as well as uh, uh, remotely, especially because we provide SASE on-premises using our SD-WAN, secure SD-WAN devices as well. You want to be able to make sure you understand where the users are coming in from. When they are coming in remotely, you want to be able to have them do that secure tunnel connection to the SASE gateway. But then when they're connecting from a branch office, why unnecessarily have them create that extra tunnel? Because the secure is driven device on premise or the SASE on premise device already has a secure uh, connection to the SASE gateway. So during this particular case, when the client is actually behind a branch office network, when he tries to conduct the SASE gateway, the gateway instructs the client, hey, you are already secure. You're coming in from a trusted location. Uh, why don't you, I, I know now that you are authenticated, you do not have to create that extra tunnel. And that instruction comes to the SASE client. The user doesn't even know what happens and automatically the client gets uh, connected through the underlay, basically the actual LAN network to then the appropriate SASE gateway to get the protection that he needs. So this is again a differentiator that Versa has to be able to identify where the user is coming in from and appropriately apply the uh, uh, send or, or create the policies that is required. I'm sorry, I do have a question. Sure. Um, when uh, when you talk about always on um, uh, as well as uh, pre log on. Um, what happens when we can't reach the gateway? What happens when the Versa client can't reach uh, one of your POPs and actually you know, authenticate and get on the network? What happens to the traffic then? 
So I mean, in, in the in, in the case of I'm, I'm trying to reach back to my own enterprises networks. Okay, they're not reachable. But what if I'm what if I'm doing a default route through the tunnel? So if it is a default route, so if it if it is in a fail close mode, for example, right? Then uh, unfortunately, he will not be able to access any network. But if it is not, if it doesn't have a connection back to the gateway and it is, doesn't have a fail close uh, operation, then he'll still be able to access other internet uh, destinations. So he'll be able to continue to uh, use his laptop for other things. But to be able to connect back to his network, uh, we should definitely have our connection to the gateway so that appropriate private destination can be accessed through our secure tunnel. Uh, I'll let our security architect add some clarity if you want. I think it's the right time to ask this question. Do you have the, the mechanism for the, the gateway redundancy? Let's say if the gateway one fails to, to fail over to the second one uh, without relying on the DNS uh, to, to resolve the, the tunnel endpoint. So that is correct. So the so my name is Sunil Ravi. I'm the chief security architect at Versa Networks. So uh, what we have done with the SAP, the Versa endpoint client, the secure access client, is we built SD WAN light into the into the client, so it has visibility into the gateways that uh, that it is allowed to connect to, and based on that, it's actually receiving like SLAs and path measurements and information about the reachability. So at that point, like if uh, it loses connectivity to either one or more gateways, it would be able to automatically fail over to the other gateway and reach out. So that is actually like automatically built in. Um, and we have like fail open and fail close kind of like functionality where if we like completely like um, lose connectivity, depending on the fail open and fail close connectivity um, uh, or uh, configuration settings, we would actually allow either like limited connectivity or like we completely shut down the access to the network. So that's kind of like what, uh, what we currently provide. Thank you. Thanks. Um, can I, I just need to extend that question because you're using IPsec for those tunnels. Are you using uh, built in tools with IPsec like uh, dead peer detection and things like that? Or have you built um, extra checks and balances into your client? Uh, great question. Uh, Apurva, uh, do you want to add some thoughts to that? Yeah. So, uh, so our IPsec client is uh, fully compliant. So it does support all this dead peer detection and all of that. And whenever basically there is a loss of gateway uh, with loss of connectivity to one gateway, then uh, basically, um, uh, then we would automatically connect uh, to another gateway, which has got the same tenant, uh, which basically has the same tenant instantiation on it. So does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. And follow on to that. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, kind of simple to test for up down scenarios. What about degradation of services, uh, um, SLAs to switch between tunnels, or are you going to cover that in a, in a follow-on slide? Yeah, no, very good question. So what Versa supports is TVAMP. So uh, TVAMP is two-way active monitoring protocol. So what it does is it basically, it, uh, it's not something simple as a BFD or ping or something where you basically send some ping packets and uh, if out of 10 ping packets, two of them are lost, then you think that uh, basically there was a 20% loss what we do do, I um, mean, uh, the SASE client actually reports uh, periodically how many uh, how many user plane packets it sent to the gateway and the other way around as well. The gateway also reports back to the client. And as a result, uh, basically, we do find out uh, what was the real inline data packet loss. And then based on the SLA, which is configured, you know, on the client, you can actually switch, you know, from one uh, one gateway to another gateway. Uh, from uh, from one under one basically uh, underly provided on uh, like the gateway can be basically connected to multiple uh, transport providers such as um, uh, let's say Comcast and Verizon. So if one of them is having an issue, then it'll automatically switch to the other one. Like I mean the, the and the issues can be in the in in the uh, in the in the intermediate network. Okay, it doesn't need to be within Verizon or within Comcast or add actually the uh, the actual service provider or the client. But somewhere in between, so it automatically basically switches based on the inline packet loss. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is the pump uh, configurable on the client itself to play with maybe the DSTP fields or uh, or maybe to uh, to measure not the ICMP or or the UDP, for example, how it is performing? Can you actually change the transfer protocol? Or it's, a, or it's a fixed? 
No, I said, I said basically, so what we use is TVAM, uh, two-way active monitoring protocol. So basically that's the uh, ITF protocol by itself, right? So that's the one which we use. Uh, initially we do use, during the best gateway selection, we do use some amount of, uh, like uh, we will basically compute the round trip uh, packet loss based on ping and all of that. But then, you know, if we find a better gateway based on TVAM, then that's what we will use. Thanks, Rupa. So now that the user is actually at the gateway, he needs to get applied with appropriate uh, segment, uh, appropriate application segment segmentation. So that is done by using our firewall as a service, which will basically let him allow or allow him to access only specific applications on the data center. Also, we provide additional capabilities such as network obfuscation to hide the identity of the user from the service and vice versa. So here, let me show you in one of our locations. So I'm here in Norway, trying to actually connect back to a data center application, which is in my Fremont data center, as you remember in our network topology. So when he is in Norway, when he trying to access application corporate.globex.com, he is able to access that from his laptop to uh, closest gateway, which is in Norway, use our SASE fabric to route through and appropriately egress out of our closest gateway near to the destination, which is our San Jose one, connecting to the appropriate application in Fremont. So this basically is end-to-end -end connection here. And because he accesses, he belongs to a corporate business group, he is allowed to access that. But then when he tries to access uh, another application under consultant uh, uh, application, he's basically not allowed to. And because of that, he's thrown a block form which says he is not allowed to do so. So while at it, I wanted to also show uh, one particular uh, thing about network obfuscation. So the NS lookup, the DNS lookup for this particular uh, destination, corporate.globex.com, will actually come back with a certain IP address, 100.64.100.1, which is what he thinks is the actual destination IP address. But then you can see very well in our network obfuscation uh, on, our, on our real time monitoring screens that the user, in fact, okay, so the user, in fact, uh, is trying actually accessing a different application address. So let's see that in our policy engine. So here, this is basically our monitoring screens. The IT administrator is able to actually see all of this uh, behind the scenes. Uh, and let's see what he was accessing, this particular user was accessing. So here, so here, this was the original destination as the user thought it was. But then you can see very well that it was translated to an alternate IP address using our CGNAT and DNS proxy methods. The, ident the When the DNS resolution was coming in, even though it was actually going to a uh, 8.8, 8.8.8.8.8.8.4.4, which is what he thinks he was trying to getting result to. The DNS proxy intercepted that and provided an alternate IP address to this particular user for this particular destination. And so the user doesn't know what network he's actually connecting to. So even if the user is compromised, he wouldn't know how to actually access the internal network because he doesn't have the visibility to it. Alternatively, on the flip side, if the uh, application is in fact uh, uh, it is infected or with a drive-by attack or whatnot. So you want to protect the user identity not be provided to the actual uh, application. So we basically use our CGNet and DNS proxy methods to provide that full obfuscation to then protect both the service as well as the user. Uh, just a, 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 qu a question related to the, to the network obfuscation. Um, well, well, I think that's very interesting um, I see that as being a troubleshooting nightmare, right? Anytime, anytime you use NAT in a network, when I'm trying to observe the entire flow and the source or destination is obfuscated or NATed from me, um, now I have to tie together two different points of the conversation. Um, and so, you know, I'm just thinking here, here we're tunneling traffic, we're going back to versus network, we're being source NATed, we're being destination NATed as well. Mm -hmm. You know, how do I get end-to-end -end visibility? How do I actually tie together a session between the source and the destination, the true source and the true destination? Yeah, great question. In fact, this is exactly the reason why we say we are a single pass architecture and you need both a consolidated view for both network and security events. So here within our visibility portal, the sessions that I'm seeing here, it actually, 
we are able to correlate all the events together and provide a complete visibility end to end for a specific session, all the natting that happens. And in this particular case, you're able to see the flow, that extra flow that got created, the individual actual natted destination IP. If it is a natted source IP also happened, that you'll be able to see that as well here. So all of that is captured within so that you, you, you get a complete correlated view. Uh, I'll also add, uh, let our, uh, for, uh, our CTO add some clarity, uh, additional color to this. Yeah, what you said is very correct, okay? That definitely, um, I mean, I think uh, that also we, we do have basically uh, analytics, which, which will allow you to basically correlate everything, but um, it can become messy. Uh, so, uh, so, so depending on your needs, you know, you can just choose to not snap, you can just choose, choose to not source NAT, or you can choose not to do DNAT, or basically leave the um, leave the things uh, exactly. You know, like uh, the the client itself is given an address. You know, from the you know, from the namespace of the from the of the corporation. Other other otherwise, it is given uh, address which belongs to the gateway. Suraj, so you would have already thought that. Yeah, right? exactly. yeah. Okay. So we ba basically do give you the options. You know, like in fact, we also. Um, uh, for the same destination also we are for Alice and Bob, we will uh, uh, DNAT differently. We even support that kind of model for, for the super paranoid uh, people. Uh, but uh, I mean, I suppose we offer the various options. So you can choose to NAT, uh, just, uh, you, you can choose not to source NAT or DNAT. You can just um, choose to source NAT and DNAT both, but the DNAT is the same for different users, or you can, uh, the DNAT is also different for different users. So we support all of the options. Yeah, and but I just still want to add uh, the point that I also mentioned, right? So both our real-time monitoring visibility tool that I just showed, right. as well as our analytics, gives you the correlated view for every event. Absolutely. That way, you will be able to say for a single flow, all the different correlated flows or the child sessions that really happened. That is correct. Yeah. So irrespective, you know, uh, I mean, if you basically the analytics will still give you complete visibility. So what, what good is a system if it is not giving you the 100% or 360 degree view, right? Our analytics portal gives a complete visibility in, team, in terms of real time as well as time series, as well as give you the visibility for every user from every location, what kind of amount of traffic that they did, uh, volume of traffic, number of sessions, the bandwidth, the latency, the digital the packet loss, what was allowed, what was denied, how many users access a specific gateway at a given point of time, all of that. And like we just talked about the correlation between the network and security events so that we can give that, get that in a single pane. So uh, some of the key takeaways I just wanted to leave you with is, what's a ZTNA solution is basically giving you a patented, intelligent traffic engineered SASE fabric. It gives you the SD band to the user device, provides multi-tenancy end-to-end, provides user to application segmentation, security at each and every stage and provides a complete SASE on-premises as well as the SASE remote to provide full ZTNA for both users coming in from a branch as well as remotely.